Good morning, God's beloved, and welcome to worship with University Christian Church. Whether you are here in person or joining us online, welcome to this time of worship. I'm Reverend Megan Pegler, the senior minister here, and I am so glad to be worshiping with all of you today. If you would take a moment to sign in, especially if you are a first-time visitor, we would really appreciate that. There's a QR code on the back of your bulletin where you can do that online. There are also some cards in the backs of your pews where you can turn them into the offering plates a little bit later on. And if you are joining us online, there's a link in the description of this video. If you find yourselves in need of a restroom at any point during the service, you can go through this side door at the front and there will be signs pointing you to where you need to go. I want to thank everyone who attended the All Church Retreat yesterday. It was a wonderful time, very rejuvenating. Uh, thank you especially to our community ministry deacons who took care of all of the food and drink logistics for the day. Uh, it was a great day from top to bottom, so thank you all. Immediately following worship today, there will be a trustees meeting in the fellowship hall, and all current and incoming trustees are invited to attend. If you'll take a look at the back of your bulletin, I want to point out one more thing that's coming up. The title of this says All Church Sunday School with Billy Joe Miller, but that's a little misleading. He will be here both June 11th, June 4th, and June 11th for Sunday School activities and post-worship activities, and you can learn more about that there. Um, Billy Joe Miller is the artist that the Endowment for Creative Ministry Program Committee has uh, chosen for our commission that will be out in the uh, courtyard, and you'll hear a little bit more about that um, later today during the sermon, um, but we want everyone to be a part of this time of discernment and brainstorming. Part of why the program committee selected him was because the plan wasn't completely final, because he wanted our input. So this will really be a piece of art that is born out of our own community. So we need everyone's uh, participation in that, whether you are a longtime member or a new visitor, uh, as long as you are somehow connected to us, we want you to be a part of this time together. And now, beloved, peace to you, and welcome to this time of worship. Mm -hmm.
hear this call to worship from Psalm 68. Sing to God, kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises to God. Awesome is God in God's sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to us. Blessed be God. Now please rise in body or in spirit as you are able to sing together hymn number 499. Let us rejoice before God. Let us all be jubilant with joy. Let us sing to God. For God gives new life and renews the face of the earth. Friends, you'll see in your bulletin that the pastoral prayer is a responsive one when I pray after an intercession, O God, in your mercy, you will respond with hear our prayer. You will see on the back of our bulletins, we have all of our prayer requests listed. Um, Typically one that are brand new will be bolded, but I do have one to add for us, and it is for Natalie. She and her husband Dave just joined the church on Easter. Just pray for Natalie. She has some upcoming medical procedures. She would like for us to lift her up. Siblings, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Redeeming God, you call us to devote ourselves constantly to prayer. Therefore, let us offer our prayers today on behalf of your church and your world. We pray. We pray for those who have asked us to pray. We pray especially for Natalie. We pray for those whose needs are not known to us, but those whose needs are known only to you. O God, in your mercy. Rescuing God, parent of orphans and protector of widows, You give the desolate a home to live in and lead out prisoners into prosperity. Help us to order the patterns of our common life 
to support the health of your human family and the welfare of the world. O oh God, in your mercy. Steadfast God, you have given to your church the inheritance of faith in Christ and bestowed your spirit's love upon us to make us one in you. Help us to grow in strength and courage to witness this hope that all may find your love eternally. O oh God, in your mercy. Life-giving God, you send rain to relieve the parched crops and thirsty land, and you make clean the winds of heaven. Help us to find sustainable solutions as we seek to honor and care for the well-being of your creation. O oh God, in your mercy. Loving God, you have heard the sufferings of your people. You have listened to our cries. You sent a son into the world who was no stranger to our pain. Help us, O oh God, to offer your healing and your compassion to our neighbors, particularly ones who are being oppressed, as we minister to others in the mercy of Christ. O oh God, in your mercy, we pray these things and more in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, if the children will come forward. Hello, Harry. Michaela's coming. Hi, Miss Michaela. Can you come sit by Harry? Hi. Hello, friends. I'm so happy to see you today. Is everyone doing okay? Yeah? Did everyone have a good week? Yeah? That's so good. So in just a little bit, Miss Joan is going to read from the Bible, and we're going to hear a prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples, but Jesus was also praying for us. Did you know that? It's cool, right? Yeah? Okay. We can hear that Jesus prayed for us all to be one. Do you know what that means, for everyone to be one? Do you know what it means? You do? No? It means for all of us to look out for each other 
and to be together and to make sure that everyone is doing okay. So we can love one another and we can accept one another just like God loves and accepts all of us. Because we think about it, God created one world for us all to live in together. And for us to live in that world together, we have to be living in unity. So how do we do that? How can we live as one? What do you think? Yeah, I love everyone on earth. Yes, that's exactly right. So one of the most important things that we can do is love everyone, Harry. You are absolutely right. So just because we live in a certain place or we look a certain way or we believe a certain thing doesn't mean that we are the ones who are right and everyone else is wrong. It means that this person was still created in the image of God and we still love them very much, right? Yeah, okay. So let's pray, just like Jesus did. You want to repeat after me? Dear God, Help us to love one another just like you do. Thank you for making our one awesome world. Help us to be one in Christ. Amen. You guys are awesome. Thanks so much. Have a good day. Do you need help?
Our scripture reading this morning is from John 17, verses 1 through 11. You can find it on page 105 in the Pew, I almost said dictionary, Bibles. <laughs> <laughs> After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you, whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words you that you gave to me I have given to them and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world but on behalf of those whom you gave me because they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. This ends the reading. Will you pray with me? God of all love, Pour out your spirit on us, that our ears and hearts will be open to the word that you intend for us to hear this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this Easter season, we have been imagining a world with more. More resurrection, more compassion, community, hope, beauty. And today we are talking about a world with more unity. It's a very disciples sermon. That is one of our things in our denomination is uh, Christian unity and, and unity of humanity. And it does seem like we need a lot more unity in this world. Would anyone agree with me that we could probably use a fire hose of unity all over the place until our landscapes that have been parched by strife and division are watered again. In Jesus' prayer in John 17, we heard just part of it today, the first 11 verses, it goes for the whole chapter. We are hearing some very intimate prayer between Jesus and God. We are overhearing kind of a stream of consciousness type of prayer. It's not especially well-ordered. It can be sometimes hard to follow. It wanders a bit. And more than once, Jesus prays for unity, that they may be one as we are one. And oneness, keep in mind, is not uniformity. It's not everyone agreeing about everything and being in lockstep on every topic or issue or way of being and thinking and doing. Jesus is praying that the one family of God, because we are all God's children, will love each other and love each other well, differences and all. Because that is how Jesus will be made known in a world that needs to know him. That is how Jesus will be made real to people, is how well we love each other. 
there's an organization, the Wisconsin Council of Churches, that they do a whole lot of good in the state of Wisconsin, but also out of it. They are a great resource for many religious leaders. They're an ecumenical group of 21 Christian traditions, and they are intentionally working across differences, focusing on issues of peace with justice and church vitality and the well-being of all of our neighbors. And recently they hosted a two-part webinar with Nathan Stock. It was led by Nathan Stock from the Carter Center, and he focuses on and so the first part of this webinar was called, Why Are We Divided? So one week, there was an hour-long webinar on this topic, and then the following week followed up with, What Can We Do About It? These are necessary questions in a world that normalizes, reset, normalizes resentment and discord and separation. The first webinar focused on the drivers of polarization. And Mr. Stock, who was leading the webinar, said again and again throughout this session how this was a bit of a downer, this first <laughs> webinar. He, said, he kept seeing, saying, come back for next week because there is hope. But we have to ask why first to begin with so that we can do something about it. He talked about the structural drivers of polarization, how places with winner-take-all elections have been shown to be prone to violence, all types of violence, including political violence. We have seen that more and more, especially uh, in our own state and others, as uh, state legislatures are going after vulnerable communities, including our trans siblings. Another structural driver of polarization are shifting and changing demographics. Gets people feeling like they might lose some uh, stance, some a bit of power in the world. We have closed media ecosystems. We've talked about this before, where we are hearing our own opinion echoed back to us again and again. There is a marked decline of trust in institutions that contributes to this polarization. And more and more, and this has been going on for at least 20 years, people have been moving to live in politically homogenous communities, which just separates us again more. There are psychological and behavioral drivers of polarization where belonging becomes more important than facts. So once we align ourselves with one particular um, way of being or thinking or one particular political party or club or anything, that is what matters more, is cohesion with that group more than what is actually happening and going on in the world. There are differences in moral formation and neurological predispositions that make some folks more apt to see the world in one way versus another. And he pointed out that politics has become our identity, but more than that, it has become our religion. And so when we in the church go along with our cultural polarization, we're not actually doing a very good job of being the body of Christ. We are not living out our mission of healing and reconciliation. Theologian Debbie Thomas writes, such is the power we wield in our decisions to love or not love. Such is the responsibility we shoulder whether we want to or not. If we decide to love or to not love, we are saying something about Jesus. And that is a heavy burden to bear. And like she said, we, we want that responsibility or not, but we have it. And again, that's not to say that we have to agree on everything be able to love one another. God created 
loves and celebrates all sorts of diversity. We see it all over nature. We see it in the personalities of the disciples that we read about in scripture and in the disciples who we are sitting next to today. We see this beautiful diversity in all of humanity with all our many unique characteristics and skills and gifts and perspectives. Cheryl Lindsay from the United Church of Christ points out that Jesus in his prayer that we overhear in John 17, he doesn't ask for them to prevail over Rome He doesn't ask to grow the church to a certain size. He does not pray for their strength, resolve, or discernment. Jesus prays that they may be one, because in their unity of spirit, they collectively will have what they need to be fruitful and advance the reign of God in the world. So part two of the webinar was instructive. I actually listened to it in the car and almost like a podcast. And when I got home, I had to go back and listen to certain parts again because there were there was so much goodness. So I commend both parts of the webinar for you. They'll be in tomorrow or Tuesday's happenings email that go out if you'd like to watch it yourself. But when he got back to part two about How can we depolarize? What can we do about this deep division? Again and again, he stressed how hard it is. This is a huge task. This is nothing we're going to solve overnight. But there are things we can do, and we can have hope. And so he looked at three different levels of what we can do. And because I think preachers and academics and nonprofit people, we really like alliteration. (laughs) I don't know if you've ever noticed that. (laughs) He had the three C's, the three different levels of uh, depolarization. First is the cousin level. And he said, not literally your cousin. This is just to represent uh, interpersonal relationships, one-on-one, close together. And so his recommendations for the cousin level are to listen actively. So not to be thinking about any rejoinders that you're gonna come back to this person about what they're saying and then you kind of tune out. Do any of you ever do that? I know I am guilty of it. I'm listening to someone, they're pouring their heart out and I might be like, well, they're wrong and I'm gonna tell them how and this is how I'm gonna do it and this and this and this. That's not the way to do it. (laughs) It's not the best approach. We have to actually listen to each other and maybe even reflect back to them what we heard them say. And when we're doing that, we can even maybe point out those areas of agreement that we have. Because surely there's some some point, some aspect we both agree. He says that we should tell a story about how we came to our own views and to always go into these interactions not assuming that we are going to convince the other person, not assuming we're going to ever agree. And to to commit to these repeated interactions. It's not just a one and you're done. Okay, I listened to that one person one time. That's enough. We have to be in it for the long haul. And so the big point of this cousin level interaction is developing understanding and building trust. Very hard to do. It's easier sometimes to pick up our marbles and go home, but that is the first level of this depolarization effort. And then he talks about the community level. That would be like at a congregational level or a neighborhood association or something that is a group of people where we find ourselves working together on some project that we can all agree on. That goes a very long way. He talks about leveraging cross-partisan institutions. Sounds like a task for the church. 
setting expectations about how we should treat one another and what we should expect from our leaders, doing that on the community level. And then finding opportunities to reset. And the sad uh, fact of the matter is that crises often serve as wake-up calls to us. When something really horrible happens in our community or in another nearby community that we care about, suddenly those, those positions that we take don't matter as much as finding a, an actual solution and making headway together. And then he talks about the country level. And this is contributing to reform and systems change. This is bigger, this is harder, but it's just as important. He talked a lot in this section about working for racial equity, and he pointed out some various efforts, including one example of uh, the Equal Justice Initiative's Community Historical Marker Project. Have any of you been to the EJ, EJI Museum in Montgomery? A couple of people, okay. Um, yesterday at our church retreat, uh, we were chatting about this uh, memorial museum with our guest speaker for the day, and she's an Episcopal priest, and she said that the Episcopal Church goes on civil rights pilgrimages, which I thought was just a beautiful idea. And in addition to our mission trips that the church likes to go on, what if more of us did things like that? We piled into a church van and we drove to Montgomery and we saw this memorial to lynching victims. There are powerful things we can do together to have a reckoning that never has actually happened on a national level. He ended the second webinar by reminding us that we have got to have grace for all of our fellow Americans who are locked up in this complex system. I distilled it a lot because it's much bigger than any of us. It's a lot to take in. But I think that each of us as Christians, as part of the body of Christ, who are called to the mission of reconciliation, and especially our own denomination, and you might not be super familiar with the history and positions of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, but we are, I think, especially poised to take on this task of overcoming polarization, because unity defines who we are as a community of faith. One of our founders, Barton Stone said, let unity be our polar star. And another, Thomas Campbell, wrote that the church of Christ upon earth is essentially, intentionally, and constitutionally one. One of our denominational offices is the Christian Unity and Interfaith Ministry, formerly known as the um, Council on Christian Unity. And they collaborate with denominational partners, with ecumenical partners, interfaith partners, to create a more just and peaceful world. They engage and educate and equip the whole church to embody the vision of Christian unity that Jesus prayed about. The unity of all of humanity, really. And we have a denominational statement of identity. You can see part of it, coincidentally, on today's insert in your bulletin. It starts off by saying, we are a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. That is a strong statement to make in the world as it is today. About a year ago, a little over a year ago, the Program Committee for the Endowment for, Christian, for uh, Creative Ministry of our church decided that we would commission a piece of art that would go out in our courtyard. And we didn't know anything about commissioning a piece of art, really. We were figuring it out as we went, but we did decide pretty early on what we wanted the theme to be 
because we would have to put out a request for proposals out to artists and give them some kind of a hint of what we were looking for. And so we started talking about what really matters to us and what is mattering to the world and what is some visual ministry we can do for the thousands of people who walk outside of our church every day to minister to them. What is the need? And the program committee discerned that we wanted to communicate healing and wholeness. The more that we talked and the more that we engaged with the different artists who applied, it kind of shifted from healing and wholeness more into welcome. And they are connected intimately. And so our artist, Billy Joe Miller, as I said at the beginning of the service, will be here for two Sundays in June, June 4th and 11th. And his main idea is to have in both of our planters out in the courtyard stained glass-like arched panels. He was going off the arches all throughout our church and that are on our bell tower and they're going to be angled and positioned in such a way that it's like ushering in those passers-by because we want to in some way try to say you are welcome here you are loved you are embraced by God whoever you are It's not an easy task. Some people aren't going to be interested in seeking it with us, overcoming this division and polarization, trying to get more unity. It's not easy, but it is easy. It's just as easy as talking and listening and loving and blessing and gathering around a table, that they may be one as we are one, Jesus prayed. May it be so. As Megan said, uh, next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. I don't know whether you said that or not, but you should have. Uh, it's, am I bad? Yes. Um, gifts to the Pentecost offering received in our congregation today and next Sunday help ensure that the new church ministry movement continues to embody the disciples of Christ vision to be and to share the good news. Witnessing, loving, and serving from our doorstep to the ends of the earth. We seek wholeness in a fragmented world. Uh, the, there's information on the back of your bulletin about how to give in other ways than just writing a check. There's a QR code. And there's also information on the uh, insert that's inside the bulletin and an envelope that you can use. There are um, offering trays at the front of the sanctuary on these pedestals. I ask you to please give generously.
of the universe, we gather this morning with thankful hearts. Thankful that even when the world feels heavy, we feel your presence and your love. We are thankful that even when your image is disfigured by poverty, sickness, selfishness, war, and greed, Jesus Christ is present, here with us in justice, love, and peace. We are thankful for the unity in Christ and with each other, in suffering and in joy, that all of your children may be drawn to your abundant dwelling, to the, to the glory of your name. May we continue to be reminded with your help that in, that in essentials we have unity, and non-essentials liberty, and all things charity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. the first part of the disciples' uh, statement of identity, we are a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. And the next part is that as one part of the body of Christ, we welcome all to the Lord's table as God has welcomed us. All are welcomed here. This is Christ's table. You don't have to be a member here. You don't have to have ever been here before. You could be anyone and you are welcome at this place. We remember on the night that Jesus was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This, this is my body, which, which is, is for you. Do, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, the cup after supper, saying, This, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. According to his commandment, we remember his death, we, we proclaim, proclaim his, his resurrection. resurrection. We, we await, await his coming in glory. glory. As your children, God, we are united by faith in a living God who is revealed to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We are united by faith in Christ, whose word fills us with faith and calls us to live gospel-inspired lives. We are also united in faith in the Holy Spirit, whose presence sustains and guides us throughout our lives. 
when we come together as one body at this table, it is a prayer itself, and it is often prayer enough. Here we are drawn into a circle of unity, and we share a simple sacramental meal, extending welcome to all and excluding none. Here we gather and we remember the one who calls us into community, who binds us together and who offers grace on our behalf. In the breaking of bread and the sharing of the cup, may we be filled and may we feel the call to be joined in sacred unity. Hear our prayers in the name of your Son, the Christ. Amen. When you are ready and as you are able, you're invited to come down the center aisle to receive communion from our elders. Each tray has little cups of both bread and juice. You're invited to partake of the bread as you receive it, and then it's a long-standing tradition here in this congregation to share the juice together. So if you feel comfortable carrying it back to your seat with you, um, we will all take it together at the end. If you prefer to take it as you receive it, that is fine as well. And if you need someone to bring you communion, just stay seated and raise your hand, and I will be by to bring it to you. The feast is prepared and all are welcome. Let us share.
body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the blood of Christ, the cup of new life. If you're looking for a community of faith to call your own and would like to make that place University Christian Church, please reach out to me or to Pastor Chelsea anytime this week, or if you're ready to make that commitment today, you're invited to come forward during the singing of our closing hymn. And I will uh, give everyone a heads up that at the end of that hymn, don't put your hymnals away because I do have an announcement and you will need to turn to number 341 <laughs> in your hymnals. joyful announcement to share that Arwen Weeks is joining University Christian Church as a student member. She holds her 
um, regular membership at Connection Christian Church in Odessa, where her parents are the pastors, and we're so glad that they are um, here with us today as well. If you would all turn to number 341 in your hymnals, we are going to um, officially welcome you together. Uh, Arwen has been visiting us for some time now, a couple years, um, off and on with the school year and with COVID and everything, so um, you have been a blessing to us already uh, in your time here as an active participant in the Labyrinth Progressive Student Ministry, and we welcome your presence in the life of the church. So I've got a couple questions for you. Do you reaffirm your faith in Jesus the Christ? If so, please say, I do. I do. And do you promise to continue following in the way of Jesus to grow in faith and to participate in the life and mission of this community of God's people? If so, please say, I promise with the help of God. I promise with the help of God. Wonderful. And now, church, it's our turn to make some promises. So let's join together in number 341. Reaffirming our own faith in Jesus the Christ, we gladly welcome you into this community of faith, enfolding you with our love and committing ourselves to your care. In the power of God's Spirit, let us mutually encourage each other to trust God and strengthen one another to serve others, that Christ's church may in all things stand faithful. Arwen, in the name of Jesus Christ, I extend to you the right hand of Christian fellowship, welcoming you into this family of University Christian Church. Let's clap. <laughs> and Arwen will be out in the narthex after the service for anyone who would like to um, greet her one-on-one. -on -one. And now receive this benediction. Beloved, as you go from here, may you know, share, and embrace the immeasurable love God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus. Go in the grace and goodness of God to share God's peace and good news with the world. Amen.